I'm up here um, because it's fun. <laughs> I mean, I know what you're all thinking. This is so bad for his ego, being up here. But I have to tell you something. I, I, I don't mind bragging about this. I have um, one seriously um, relevant uh, relative, no longer with us. Um, he was a man called Wesley. That means nothing to you. None of you are Methodists, are you? Well, Charles Wesley and Samuel Sebastian Wesley. I think, are we going to sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing later? Me. I wrote that. Well, my relative did, you know, same stuff. Why am I here? Uh, some time ago, like many people in this room, I got the fright of my life, um, and I had a, a cancer in my larynx. It was discovered. Um, I got lucky. I walked into the room and there was Peter Reese Evans and the first thing I noticed about him and remember about him um, and know about him now was his extraordinary gift of kindness. And when you are with uh, someone like that and you know it, what is going to happen is going to be difficult. It is the most important part of the character of, of anyone. So we formed a friendship, I think, before I even had an operation, and most certainly um, afterwards. And what he showed me was this extraordinary sensitivity, uh, and I knew this was a great doctor. I did not know about Oracle or about the work that had been done by Oracle. I just knew I was with a, a great man of medicine, Anyway, I went and did my radiotherapy um, at the Marsden, uh, which was extraordinary. And I want to tell you a happy tale about these things. I can't remember. I think I went in for four weeks or six weeks. I can't remember. But I loved the people there. They all looked and behaved as if they were 12. <laughs> they looked so young. And they were so competent. They knew exactly what they were doing, and I felt that all the time. And they treated me as if I was the only patient they'd seen that week. And they were seeing them all the time, every 20 minutes, every half an hour. I knew that. But they again were showing this kindness, this extraordinary kindness. And I was so touched by that, that at the end of my treatment, and I haven't forgotten this moment, I knew it was the end and I wasn't going to be seeing them again. And I got to know them quite well over the four or six weeks or whatever. And I said, you've been so kind. You're much, much, much kinder than my wife. <laughs> and one of them said, well, we don't have to look after you all the time, do we? <laughs> so they were honest as, as well as everything else. I'm honored to be patron of this charity, really honored. It means a lot to me. And I wanted to ask you, particularly this year, when it has been so hard to keep going, to keep going, um, to think about one thing, and I've learnt it in these last two years, and many of us have, who are not medical people. I don't think we really realised that it's the science that does this thing, and the great doctors, in a sense, the people you see, are at the tip of this extraordinary gathering of knowledge and understanding, um, which we have no insight into at all if you're a lay person like me. But now, after two years of this stuff, you suddenly realize who are the people you should be listening to. Not the people standing in front of the Union Jacks, no, no. The scientists, the people who know. And you know what they do better than anyone else? They also say, I don't know which, of course, is where all knowledge grows from. So I have a particularly strong passion now for the learning of science in young people, because I grew up, we were divided when I was young into arts people and science people, and I rather despised anything. To, it's from that that I, I live my life now. I wouldn't have my life now had it not been for that science. 
So I just want to urge you, I'm going to do it, to put your hands into your pocket quite deep if you can, this year in particular, and focus on the extraordinary work that is behind the kindness that does the healing, because it is the science and the healing together uh, that does the work. Um, I've got to come now. I'm really enjoying this. I didn't ever want to leave the pulpit. <laughs> but I've got to come down now because I've got to play another role down there, which I'll tell you about, um, which is different. So I'm going to have to say goodbye to my ancestors. Thank you, Wesley. Um, see you in a moment. <laughs> We're going to do three parts from um, a wonderful piece called Carnival of Animals by Saint-Saëns. If you know the piece of music, could you raise your hand? Higher, higher, be proud. Good, thank you. That's not enough. But there we go. He wrote several, several pieces in Carnival of Animals. It's about a 25-minute long thing. We're going to just play three of them. And what he did, he had this idea to write... Um, a piece of music, about 13 of them, I think, uh, one for each animal. And he selected the animals. Uh, and they, sometimes they get poets and writers to write little snippets to introduce the piece of music. So I was asked, and asked me why, they should have asked someone proper, but they asked me to write a poem about these animals. And I loved it. I discovered, age 77, the inner Shakespeare in me. <laughs> and uh, I became a poet. Would you please clap? <laughs> Um, so what happens is I read a poem, um, and then Claire will play. And if you like what she plays, then you clap. Don't clap the poems, please. I, I shan't mind. I shan't be offended. Are you ready? The first one, children like this animal. It's called a tortoise. Do you like tortoises? Yeah, yeah, of course you do. Here you go, then. Tortoise. You people are obsessed with speed. You know you are. You know the fable? Well, of course you do. The hare with the speed ego took a nap. And I won. But what the hare didn't know, nor La Fontaine, was that I don't like racing. Never saw the point of it. I'm happy. We're happy. Being slow. Slow is good. Slow is cool. Imagine a world where we all go slow. No need, no wish for cars or trains or planes. Imagine an Olympics where the slowest wins. Tortoises on every winner's podium. Gold medals round our necks. No need to build any more houses. We carry ours with us. And we're still here. After millions and squillions of years, you may worship speed, but you'll wear yourselves out. We never do. We never have. Take it easy. Go slow, and you'll go happy. Take it from a tortoise. <laughs>
apostles, Saint-Saëns would have loved it. His carnival of animals played in the museum and in the audience, Brontosaurus and us. We sit here gazing up, amazed at him, watching him listen, wishing he was, hoping he was, all of us willing him to be living and breathing. And then, do not scoff, we saw him swaying to the sound, moving to the music, his feet bones tapping, his leg bones, his hip bones, his body bones, his tail bones, his neck bones, his head bones. He was shaking it all about, doing the brontosaurus. Then we were too up on our feet and dancing with him, a carnival of happy bones. <laughs> Swan, I am serene, I am silent, I am swan, I do not swim, I glide, I do not fly, I float, air and water are the same to me, you are all the same to me, and I am the swan you want me to be. I will be Swan on the lake for all of you. I will preen, I will dance, I will raise me up and beat my wings. I will sing with my wings the sweetest song. I will land impossibly, gracefully. I will arch my neck. I will be beautiful for you. I am beautiful, for I am swan. But beware and take care. Come too close with my family following on, and I can be swift to anger. Then I am swift to be wild, my wild self again. But for now, I am the swan you want me to be, speechless. Listen to my silence.
I've been talking every morning to Blackbird, telling him why we are all so sad. He sits on his branch and listens. It was Blackbird's idea. He sang it out this morning at dawn from his treetop in the garden to Fox, half asleep, behind the garden shed. She thought it a good idea, too. It was a wake-up call. Fox was on her feet at once and trotting through Bluebell Wood where she barked it to deer who ran off across the stream. Kingfisher was there, Otter and Dipper, too. They heard and piped it on, and Swallow swooped down over the meadow and passed it on to cows waiting to go into their milking, and to sheep resting quietly under the hedge with her lambs in the corner of the dewdamp field. And they all agreed, bleating it out to bees already busy at their flowers, to weaving spiders and grasshoppers and scurrying mice. Trees were listening to all the trees, waving their budding leaves in wild enthusiasm. High above in the skies, clouds gathered, driven by wind, and wind took Blackbird's idea over the cliffs across heaving seas, where gulls and albatross cried it out, and whales and dolphins and porpoises heard it, and wailed and whooped it down into the deep where turtles listened. And they too loved the idea. So did plankton and every fish and crab and sea urchin and whelk. They all whispered that it was a fine notion, the best they had ever heard. In rivers, salmon and sea trout leapt for joy to hear it, eagles Soaring above on wide wings, flew over the mountains, crying it out loud, and the echoes were heard deep in the dens below, where slumbering bears listened, lost in their dreams of spring. They snored and grunted their approval, even in their sleep. Snows melted at the thought of it, and the whole wonderful idea flooded down the mountain streams and far out to sea where the tide took it and carried it over the sea on curling waves to distant shores to parched plains where lions roared their approval, elephants trumpeted it, leopards yawned it, water buffalo belched it, wild dogs yelped it, and wildebeest murmured it out across the wide savannah. Then Storm lifted the idea up over rainforests, where rain took it and poured it down on gorillas in the mist, on chimpanzees in their sleeping nests. And Crocodile swished his tail in his swamp and clapped his great jaw shut, smiling at the very thought of it. Howler monkeys and gibbons echoed their calls loud. Over all the earth they are that loud. And then from far up high, sun heard it too and shone it down over deserts where Oryx stamped her foot, impatient to be getting on with it and doing it. She loved the idea that much too. Even Camel, who rarely joined in anything, thought this was the best and most beautiful idea he had ever heard. Back in the garden, Blackbird waited till everyone was ready, and then he began to sing. The whole carnival of animals heard him, and every living thing on this good earth joined in until the globe echoed with the joy of it. Blackbird was very pleased, but I was still lost in sadness as I heard the earth singing around me. It was a song of forgiveness. I knew that. So I asked Blackbird if I was allowed to join in and he sang his answer back to me. My friend, 
Why do you think we are doing this? We want you and yours to be happy again. Only then will you treat us and the world right, as you know you should. Only then will all be well. So sing, my friend. Sing. Our song is your song. Your song is our song. So I sang. We all sang. Sang away our sadness. In every house and flat and cottage, we clapped and sang in every shelter and tent, in every palace and hospital and school and prison, and they heard and we heard our song of gladness echoing about us in glorious harmony across the universe. 